Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm uh, Barbara Foy, the uh, current chair of your social committee. And I am really, really happy. I am really, really pleased to welcome you all tonight to our very first ever history talk. So we're really excited to present this for you today. You know these ideas about having history talks, the idea's been percolating for a while. And we've been thinking and talking, oh, you know, so many of us came to Habersham from somewhere else. You know, either near or far. People have come from all the states, all across the country to live here. And so we thought, we're kind of curious about this place that we've decided to settle. What's the background, what's the history, what's been happening here before we all arrived? And everybody said, that's a great idea, that's a great idea. But you know, great ideas are just ideas until somebody steps up and decides that they're gonna make that happen and bring it to life. And so my colleague here, Annie, Annie Sliles, has been the person who literally put her hand up and said, I will take that on. And uh, she's done a great job of forming a new committee within the social committee that's chased these ideas. Uh, they've gathered a lot of uh, ideas, done some research on possible presenters. They've thought about venues, logistics, the whole nine yards. And so without all of these folks that do that kind of help everybody working together, this would never happen. And so if you would please just help me give them a little appreciation right now. So I've got a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. I'd like to ask you to uh, silence your phones, please, if you haven't done that. And I'd just like to mention that we've decided to, um, to uh, let Dr. Ferguson give his presentation and then take questions at the end. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, try to hold on to those, and we'll have uh, some time at the end for that, okay? And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Annis, who's going to give a proper introduction to a very special guest tonight. and welcome to the first annual History Talks series in Habersham. Again, I'm Annis Lyles and I'm thrilled to be a resident here now and the chair of the History Talks group. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Daryl Ferguson, our speaker for this evening. Dr. Ferguson graduated from George Washington University with a doctorate in business. And as a resident of Beaufort for over almost 20 some years, Dr. Ferguson has held numerous positions in the past as both the Vice President, President, and CEO of utilities and communications companies. But in both business and civic situations, Dr. Ferguson is known as being extremely tenacious and also an individual with excellent problem-solving skills. I wish I had that. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to give you a few examples because I shared this with my son the other day. He goes, wow, mom, this is really pretty cool. In the late 1960s, Dr. Ferguson discovered the U.S. Navy was about to scrap the country's most decorated World War II battleship, the USS South Dakota. So he led the statewide effort to raise the funds returned much of the battleship back to South Dakota and actually built a national museum for all of our men and women who served in the South Pacific. Pretty impressive. And I'll just give you one other example. There are multiple examples, but this one I thought was really very cool too. In the 1970s, the White House tried to get rights to buy and display the famous 23-sided Paris Peace Talks table. And if you recall, at this table, the U.S. negotiated the end of the Vietnam War. The White House failed in its attempt to acquire this famous piece of furniture. So Dr. Ferguson asked the White House, humbly, for permission to make a solo attempt as a citizen. And guess what? 
he succeeded in securing the table for America. Pretty impressive. So why are we here this evening? Well, it's very easy to say. Dr. Ferguson is the author of a new historical thriller. Many of you already have this book. If you don't, you've got to buy a copy tonight. Bruce Page is in the back. who will be selling these at the end of the event. The book, The American Conquistador, it took Dr. Ferguson 10 years to uncover this true story. And I say true in big, bold caps. But like a diehard explorer, he would not be stopped by countless obstacles. He has uncovered the lost history of Santa Elena, which is located on Paris Island. His work disclosed that the Spanish settlement on Paris Island was the first European colonial capital and settlement in the entire United States. Earlier than Jamestown, earlier than Plymouth, and earlier than St. Augustine. In short, it is where America began. So after two years, Dr. Ferguson received support for his discovery from every major historian. And in 2014, Dr. Ferguson established the Santa Elena Foundation, whose mission is to educate our children on how our country was truly first settled. Please welcome Dr. Gerald Ferguson. thing about those introductions is they never tell you about all your problems and, and your failures. <laughs> uh, and please don't call me doctor, I'm Daryl. Uh, I, I have a small farm up in Earhart, and if I said I was a doctor, I'd be running out of town. <laughs> um, let's go to work. All right. Um, Twelve years ago, I had lunch with a friend of mine, Dr. Larry Rowland, you've probably have heard. He's the eminent low country uh, historian and scholar. And as we were trading stories, he said, Darrell, I want to tell you something. You know that there's a 16th century settlement, six inches under the ground on a remote corner of Paris Island. I said, well, what year are you talking about? He said, we think it was a settlement in 1569 by the Spanish. I said, well, Larry, how can that be? I mean, we know that Plymouth was settled by the English. We've all been taught that for 450 years at Plymouth in 1620. And you're telling me this is before that? He says, I believe it is. I said, I can't even believe that. I was so taken by that and so curious that I dug into the books. I said, who are the top? two historians that I could talk to that cover that area. He says, well, there's only two. It's Dr. Gene Lyon. Um, by the way, he's a, he's a historian in Florida that located the gold ship at Tosha. And then there's Dr. Paul Hoffman. We both read books on him. Well, most of the books talk about when they came here. If you notice on discoveries of, of America and the settlements and sites, they talk about when they landed. They don't talk much about what came before. But uh, these two gentlemen just uh, knew I was interested, I was sincere, and, and they just gave me everything they had. Um, and the more I had, the, the more I wanted to dig deeper. Uh, and as soon as we established the foundation, I asked to be removed from the board. I said, gentlemen, this, thing, this story is deeper than what you and I think. And I'm, I'm studying it at night, and I've got to dedicate it. So my thought was, it was the kind of thing that maybe if you gave a year or two, you, you would uncover the real story. Eight years later, <laughs> full time, not part time. Eight years later, put aside shrimping, crabbing, boating, all that golfing. Uh, eight years later, this story comes together. And it's the most extraordinary story I've ever even heard about. Um, it basically starts with this point. When the settlers wanted to come here, Think about the original ones from Europe, Columbus. They knew one thing, that the way you would get to the Indies is 
you would have to know the weather. And the weather at that time was such that the currents for wind and water ran south to the Canary Islands. And then if you were to take a due west course, you'd get the winds off the Sahara Desert and it would take you right to an island very close to Puerto Rico. And from there, if you wanted to go into Mexico, like Cortez had, did in 1519, you just skirt under Cuba and go straight in. And by 1530, where uh, Pizarro discovered gold and silver in South America, what he had to do is take the same route, come down here, take a hard right, and once you got on the islands, go straight south into northern Colombia, Cartagena. And of course, once they found gold and silver in the Americas, they once they hit Cartagena, then they'd take a side trip up to the Isthmus of Panama, send a messenger to the Pacific side, say, we landed, and they would take the gold and silver from the Pacific over mule trains or by the rivers and load them up. The problem was in the wintertime. They couldn't immediately go back. They had to kind of wait half a year. So they would winter in, they would winter in um, Havana because it had a port facility and a deep harbor. And then in early spring, they would take off with these currents that have to go straight up, grab the currents from the Gulf Stream, go around the peninsula, and right after they passed a big island, that's the day we call Hilton Head, they would start turning, as the currents show, toward the Azores, and from the Azores they'd go into Seville. Now, <coughs> this was by 1520, they knew these weather patterns. They knew the distance they had to travel, which told them the size of the ship they needed. Um, what they didn't know was what the enemy knew. And then the enemy, meaning France in this case, had these same charts. So they knew where the treasure fleet was vulnerable. And the treasure fleet was most vulnerable right before they turned east. Now here's what happened. We talk about the English landing at Plymouth in 1620. 100 years before that, a Spanish judge in 1521 sent a slave trader on a tip to this coastline. He landed in the South Santee River, which if you don't know is right 30, 40 miles north of Charleston. He landed there, captured 30 slaves, Native Americans, took them back to his Hispanola. And he, he, the judge knew he had struck the gold because he had evidence that there was a coastline with these, these uh, captive uh, Indians. And he headed off immediately to Spain to show King Charles V that he was on a coastline. And he wanted the ability to be a conquistador and an adlatano. The difference is this, a conquistador is an explorer who discovers something and is willing to seize it. A, con a adlatano is one that asks permission not just to do that, but to govern it. And if you can govern it, the king will give you all kinds of opportunities to make money. So he went to the king, the king says, you can do that. You can be an adlatano if you establish a settlement. But no slavery, and that settlement has to be in place by 1526. So in 1526, he comes with five ships. He lands again at the Santee River. He takes three ships and orders them to go down the coastline to look for the best settlement spot. They don't like Charleston Harbor, too many trees, not enough Indians. One ship, however, comes into Port Royal Sound. He looks on the calendar, it's August 18th. And that's the day they honor um, St. Helena who is the mother of King Constantine and the lady that discovered, rediscovered the three crucifixion crosses in Israel. That's part uh, Catholic saint. Another ship, and, and when he does that, and they come in, um, so he names that, that harbor, the River of Santa Elena. The second ship lands on Hilton Head Island. It lands there because that's the island that they can see from the sea at the time. It's like a big lighthouse. It's got tall trees. They can spy it easily. And that ship captain says, it's August 18, we gotta call it Santa Elena. He calls it the Baca Santa Elena, or the Point of Santa Elena. Now the third ship goes way down into the um, 
east side of the peninsula of Florida, circles back and lands around the coastline of Savannah. All three ships immediately go back to where the boss is, the judge. He looks at the data and he says, where I really want this is somewhere in Georgia, Sapelo Sound area. Um, he says, we'll call this um, settlement the San Gabriel de Moleta. Um, and he moves 450 of his settlers down there and they last four, four months. Cold weather, uh, pollution, disease, and they have to go back. Complete failure, false attempt, didn't work. But the message that went back to Spain and the, and the, and the king was simply this. They discovered a deep water harbor, deep, wide, long, right at the point where we almost have to turn towards Spain. And that's gold for them. And all of a sudden, they put the name on their chart, Apunta Santulena. Here's a copy of it. It was one of their first charts of 1530. They only had one and they put it in high protection. And all the other names are names of inlets, river inlets, and creeks. But the Punta Santillana is Europe's first designation of an area that has strategic importance to Europe. And what happens is in 1543, it was on France's map. And again, it was a strategic name for them because it represented the point in their mind where they could take their fishing fleet in Nova Scotia that they, they, they visit twice a year, arm them and drop it down and take it. That was their identification of Spain's weak spot. Now, look what happens in 1557. By 1557, the, the French are attacking Spain every which way. And uh, the king knows that the Punta is still not protected. They don't have the control of it, and who knows when the French might land there. So he sends this letter by, via his personal secretary to the Viceroy of New Spain. The Viceroy is the top Spanish official in the Americas, in Mexico City. So if you want to communicate help, you got to get right that the king would talk to the Viceroy. And they would do it, by the way, at that time in code. And here's the letter, it's a direct translation. Know ye our officials of New Spain to reside the city of Mexico, that we are sending orders to Don Luis de Velasco, our viceroy of that country, that he is to provide for making a settlement at the Punta Santa Elena. Direct evidence that Europe and Spain's first target for develop, developing in this country was not Plymouth, was not Jamestown right here. And the Punta, in their mind, was not a point. It was an area that included Hilton Head Island, Port Royal Sound, and the area around it. You are living in the Punta Santa Elena. Your home was where your first targeted for settlement. It's that simple. Now, he gave them that order in 57, but then his officials that went back and forth from uh, Seville and Madrid to Mexico City, you know, accountants, people that check the inventories, um, people that check the gold shipments. They got word that what the Viceroy had done during this period of time is delegated that assignment to a governor called Tristan de Luna. And Tristan, of course, only knew the golf course. None of those people at this time knew anything about what was the activity around the Atlantic Ocean. So his preference was not to do what the king said, but to put a, put a, a, the first settlement somewhere around there. And the word got back to the king, Philip II, that they're not listening to you. So two years later, Philip II sends this letter directly to that subordinate and copies it. And he says, as you know from the king's letter of December 57, it was fitting and very necessary to make a strong settlement at the Punta Santa Elena. But though maybe by order which the Viceroy gave you, that you have first another choice, which is to be placed other than the Punta Santa Elena, this appears not to be satisfactory. The first of all settlements we have ordered must be at the Punta, 
Think about this kind of communicating. Here's the king, not telling the viceroy, but his subordinate has other thoughts. And basically said, listen to me. I told you two years ago that you were to make it at the pontiff. You have other thoughts. Read my lips. It's going to be at the pontiff Santillan. <laughs> and that's what he's saying. I mean, I, I mean that you couldn't be more direct than that. I mean, the guy had to think, I'm going to get you know, quartered in another week. <laughs> Now, Magic Cuppins in 1552, and what is so interesting you're going to read in this book is um, if you like stories of courage and teamwork, um, and I love, I love um, Saving Private Ryan, uh, the unique courage of um, Lawrence of Arabia, Captain Phillips, things like that. If you like real leadership and courage, um, and then there's one other movie I like, but it's not true. It's Robin Hood. Robin Hood was a, um, a noble in the 13th century in England. And his king was away and captured in, in Europe. And his, the king's brother, John, wanted to take over. And he wanted at the same time get his money from the peasants and just uh, oppress them in every which way. And here comes this noble who um, Unusually, he wants to defend these peasants. He does it with a, a cadre of close friends, the men of Sherwood Forks, right? And um, does the most unique things to, to protect them at his cost. The story that follows from here is a repeat of Robin Hood, but it's deeper and it's more interesting. And it really happened. It starts basically in 1552, when there's two boys, one a peasant from Spain, the other one the highest noble in the world, same age, one day apart in age, born in 1519. And they start telling the story, create the story of a real Robin Hood situation. Pedro Menendez is, um, his father dies. And when your father dies and you're a peasant, you're in trouble. So the mother quickly remarries and has now a collection of 20 children and you can't live as a, as a peasant in Spain with 20 children. He gets farmed out at the age of around 12 to a distant relative. Doesn't work out, he doesn't like it at all. So he leaves that relationship and goes to see it as a seaman. He becomes not just a seaman. By the time he's 24, France is attacking the northern shores of Spain, trying to, to um, capture their ships and their cargo Spain puts together a, a, um, a Coast Guard, and at the age of 24, the Admiral of the Coast Guard immediately pulls him in and says, you're gonna have one of my ships. And what he does is unbelievable. The average privateer in, in Europe would capture two ships a, a year, average. He'd capture four or five a month. And he did unusual tactics, things they wouldn't expect, and he had a cadre of close followers that would do anything for him. Now, his counterpart in France is Gaspar Coligny. He was from an unusual family, uh, one of the wealthiest and highest and most powerful families in France. His uncle um, was, was actually constable of France, which, which means he ran the, the army. And if you, ran, you were head of the army, you were the most powerful noble in France. But outside of that, the family was just very independent. Unlike many others in the France that only looked at things one way, the mother would bring in and they'd talk about the issues both ways. The Protestants are coming into our country and tell them what's their strength, what's their weakness. How does that compare? Why are they doing it? He would have that conversation. So this family became not only powerful, but extraordinarily respected. And as soon as he reached a certain age, of course, he was put into the army as an officer and went up the road. But by 1552, he was made Admiral of France, not a fleet admiral. Europe didn't have ships at that time. So when they had a war, and there were many of them, they would call in uh, owners of ships, merchant ships and fishing ships, and say, can I lease your ship? We're gonna, we'll put the artillery on it, and we would expect you to, to provide uh, your captains, and you're gonna go after the Spanish fleet. And any ship you get or cargo, you're gonna get a high percentage of that. So it was a big payoff and a cheap way for, for Spain and Europe to have a navy. 
um, he was the head of that. He put the navies together. So he was head of the privateers who, as you notice, the top privateer defensively in Spain was Pedro Menendez. And in 1552, one of his ships captured Pedro Menendez. And that was something that was huge. You know, it's like you're catching the number one quarterback in the NFL. Um, well, as a ship captain would do at that time, he knew the importance of it. So he gave him a ransom. He said, you can get off this ship with your people, but you're gonna to have to have a certain size ransom. And there was a way, we can talk about it later, how they could do that, even though they're on a ship. Um, but while he was on that ship, he was allowed to be on the open deck several hours a day. And he overheard from the officers their future plans, which was upgrade their attacks on the Indies, not just take their ships, but go after their ports and their plantations. And they were talking about a timetable being within six months to a year. So he was getting inside information on France. He paid his ransom in 15 days, and he beelined for Mexico City. And when he got into Mexico City, he told the Viceroy what he had heard. The Viceroy said, I'm gonna put you on one of my ships, and you're gonna to go to the Council of Indies, which is a policy board, and tell them. Now, picture this. The policy board for the Indies is made up of nobles. He's a peasant. He's a, you know, he's an honorable guy. He's, you know, he's like a, a football player. I mean, he's recognizing it, but he's a peasant. And peasants never give talks to, to nobles. He stands up there and says, here's what I heard. And then he says, let me tell you what I think you need to do. You're now guiding your armadas, your treasure fleet with people that are past generals of the army and they don't know a damn thing about how to basically sail across the ocean. They don't, they don't have the discipline. They don't know how to create that discipline. And when a ship wants to spin off because he can get in the port and make a couple dollars quicker, that general allows them. And if you can't get a general for your fleet, you, you, you gotta have a noble. But he may know nothing about how to sail. And that's the problem we got. You've got to put people there that with maritime experience, know how to sail, know how to lead, and know what to do when they're attacked. You can imagine what these people thought. This peasant is telling me this. Well, Kaliki has another problem. He's not only Captain General, he's not only, I mean, uh, Admiral of France, but he's so well respected that in 1559, he and most of his family convert into being Protestants. And being so such a powerful family and a leader, the Protestants ask him to be their leader. So now he's in the court of an all-Catholic country um, and head of the Protestant, and they're not even allowed to preach outside of their homes. So he's searching, he's in a real tough situation. But he knows one thing, he hates Spain. He doesn't like the fact that the king sees himself as a policeman of Catholicism, and he doesn't understand why the Pope would give Spain complete control over the Americas, with the exception of Brazil. So he's after pushing Spain out of the continent. And his first attack is right here. He orders, he orders his friend John Rebo, who is also a Protestant admiral, to take a fleet not a fleet, it's really just a couple ships, and over a hundred men land at the Punta, find the Punta, and uh, create, put a fortification there with one mission. Let me know if this is a point that we can really ambush the returning treasure armada. And he builds, he finds Paris Island at the end of the harbor. He lands there and they put up a fort and he, he drops off 30 of his men. Uh, but it fails. He promises, I'll be back in six months with supplies. There's no farming capability that they, they, the French created. Um, and so every, all their supplies are based on a promise. In the 16th century, you can't promise anything like that because the weather will change and there's a war and there sure as hell was a war. Because while the men were here in April of 1562, in the following nine months, the Protestants went after the Catholic party in France, a war ensued. The details are much deeper than that. It's on fire. 
brother against brother, family against friend for one year. So when Rebald drops him off and helps him build the fort, he tries to get back to France and finds that he can't even land. So he goes into, with his allies, into England, gets into a little bit of a conflict with the Queen, and he's thrown in the power of Tower of London. So now Caligny, after this war, wants to take a second step. He wants to do this over again. We're not going to give up. We're going to push Spain off the map. But his best admiral is in jail in London, so he reaches down for Rebald's second in command, uh, a man called Rene Wadner, not the strongest leader. And this is a time, you can just imagine, it's like the gold rush in the 1840s in here. I mean, it's a different, it's Las Vegas on steroids. Different culture, different morals, different everything. And they're 2,000 miles away from the, the headquarters, and you know what it's like when you're across from headquarters, right? You kind of are pretty independent. Well, that's what happens. And what, so Caligny has, gives um, Laudanaire three ships and 300 men. And he chooses not to come back here. He wants to be a little bit closer to the Indies, to the Caribbean. So he lands at the St. John's River. And that's his target. He wants to go up the river. And the St. John's River, by the way, today is uh, right at the mouth is the um, Jacksonville. So picture that. He goes in several miles, and these 300 men build a fort. But you know what happens very shortly. These young men are tired of just looking at Indians and, and, and wondering when the next uh, ship's going to come to resupply them. They want to get away, go down into the um, Caribbean and get their way somehow to Mexico or to South America and smuggle gold. And so he's got that pressure on top of it. And then, between then and the next year, just a few months, by mid-February, the Spanish king is really worried. He sees all this turmoil going on, ships being attacked, French puts, France puts in motion attacking plantations, and he still knows he's vulnerable right here at the Punta. So he sends a letter to Menendez and says, how serious is the French threat in North America? Now, I think it was more than a letter. Uh, the king is a paper pusher, doesn't like to get out of the office, but he went out of his way whenever he could to meet with Pedro Menendez because he was an exciting guy to talk to. So chances are this was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Here's what he asked. Him. He said, how serious is the French threat in North America? And then this reply, and it's in this book, the, the translation, he said, I believe they're about to build their first settlement. We know they failed at Charlesport, but I'm getting all kinds of indications from others that they're here somewhere, and we don't know where they are here. We've got to find them and kick them out. Uh, he said, they're most likely strategy. And this had to just turn the king's ears upside down. I think they're going to use slave revolts, go down the coastline of, of the peninsula, enter there, and use slave revolts and push us out. And the king had to say, tell me a little bit more about slave revolts. Are you crazy? And no, he said two years ago, a French admiral landed at Havana. And he was only like, had a few ships but he forced a slavery road around Havana and he controlled Havana for a number of weeks. He didn't have the resources to keep it going, but he and that one man with slavery boats in Havana captured that city. He said, that's what they're gonna do. The king had to say, this guy is a little bit touched. <laughs> um, his recommendation really got, he also said there's rumors that they found a Northwest Passage, but he says, here's my recommendation. What we've got to do immediately is make a settlement at the Punta Santillo. It's, it's, we haven't done it, they're going to do it, and we've got to do it now. But three weeks later, guess what happens? He makes the announcement and he, for the signed contract of Pedro Menendez that he's going to be in Adlatano to settle 
two settlements, two to three settlements within three years, and the first one's going to be the Punta Santa Elena, right here. Uh, but once he signs that contract, which is around March 10th, 10 days later, <coughs> all hell breaks loose. A Spanish ship from Cuba arrives at the Court of Seville with three French prisoners, deserters from Fort Carroll. And you can imagine what the reaction was. They, the, the king is not aware that there really is a fort. They think there is. They think there's a cell. They, they're put right to his office and said, talk to these men. The king says, where are you from? He says, Fort Carolina. And the king's hair has to bristle. How many of you are there? There's three of us, 300 of us. What's your understanding of what's going to be next? It's our understanding that we're going to be resupplied in two to three months, this coming June and July, by a complete armada, and that there'll be enough equipment to start making other fortresses down into the Indies. Can you imagine what that king thinks? He hasn't protected the Punta yet, and now he knows they're already there. It's a second fort. He immediately sends three messengers to Menendez, who's a novelist, and he, he always did that in emergency. He'd send them different ways, so he knew that he, Menendez was gonna get the message, and he sent coded messages on the return ship to everybody in the Caribbean. We're at war, he says to Menendez, Menendez, I want to see an armada going there as fast as possible. We can't wait for four months to load it. I want it done in two months, and let's get moving. All of a sudden, an actual race is established to, to basically see who's the first to get to St. John's River. Cut to the chase. Did you ever know that there was going to be a race between two countries to see who would first up this country? I didn't know that. But that's what really happened. There's not a school kid that knows that story. But that's what unfolded. All of a sudden, France puts this plan together. They'll leave in late May from Dieppe with seven ships and 600 to 800 men. And they will, they will follow the traditional path to go to the Canary Islands. But the Queen Mother says, whatever you do, you can go. You can do this, but don't be seen by the Spanish. I don't want the embarrassment with Philip II. So 60 miles before they, they, they see um, they spot this island, this 12,000 12, foot mountain on the Canary Islands. You can see it about 100 miles north. They see it and they, and they sail for one more day and they start turning due west, 60 miles north of the Canaries. They don't want to be seen by the Spanish New Canaries. And it's a path that's shorter and it's more direct, but it's also a lot of the direct trade routes. And then they, in the past, ships have taken that route and found themselves in calms, no winds for weeks. So it's sort of a low risk, high risk situation, but they can't avoid being seen by taking that route. They'll end up landing at the St. John's River, they believe, with 800 to 1,000 men, because they already have 300 men already there in the Fort Caroline. And they'll have at least nine ships. And they're well fortified with all the support of their Indian allies. They're in the best position. Menendez's recommendation is this. We'll take five ships from the northern Spain, the Bay of Biscay, Asturias, and my friend uh, Esteban Alas will be the admiral. I'll lead 10 ships out of Cadiz. My admiral for the entire fleet will be my admiral there, Diego Valdez, and he's exceptional. And I've worked with him for 15 years. We will meet at the Canaries right around the 1st of July. I'll send two shuttle ships back to Cadiz, and we'll leave with 13 ships and 1,200 plus men. The king has promised me that by the time I hit Hispanola and Cuba, 
that the governors there will give me another three ships and 550 men. So we'll be able to land with almost 1,900 men and 16 ships. That's the plan. Let's find out what happened. Around the 4th of July, um, <coughs> Rebolt comes down from Dieppe with seven ships. He sees the mountain and he turns at 29th degree north latitude, that shortened distance to the peninsula. At about the same time, Menendez, is, Menendez lands his 10 ships at the Canary Islands, sends two back, and he waits for his friend who uh, controls the five ships that he expects to come from northern Spain. But they don't arrive. And he waits three days and they don't arrive. So on the 8th, he takes off. And it was an unusual departure. And it's in the records. It's, it's really unusual. He, he leaves early in the morning on the 8th. And the process is the leader always goes first. So he had he led with a companion escort ship. He quickly got pushed out to sea, but almost immediately there was a calm on shore for several hours. So the remainder of his six ships are stuck there while Menendez is sailing forward. And with a couple of days, there's a gap in this fleet of about 100 miles because um, of two reasons. One, they were late, and on the first day, one of the ships in the tailing six ships convoy gets a leak, puts up an emergency sign. So they stop the, the, the whole armada of those six ships, unload him, and send the ship back to shore. So now they're not sailing with 13 ships. The tailing group is sailing with only five, and Menendez is way ahead out of sight. Now, here's what happens on July 19th. And the scene is set by two navigational experts uh, Ocean, that told me the, the scene. We, we looked at the data, and he said, here's the situation that the Admiral in this lagging five-ship convoy set. He would have woken up, and all of a sudden, he'd look in the sky, and there's a light rain. But the rain has a bronze color to it, which tells him that there's high winds coming off the Sahara Desert, lifting up sand, and that sand is coming down in that bronze rain. And then within two hours, the rain goes into a heavy rain. And then another two hours, the distance between the waves goes from four to eight seconds to 10 to 15 seconds. The waves are farther apart, and they grow higher and higher and higher. And by midday, they are so high that when they hit the top, they cascade like a waterfall. And all of a sudden, they get under the ship's bow before they crest and push it almost vertical while the, the stern slaps down. So it's one of these things and sideways. And all of a sudden, the line snapped. And the, the men have to slide down quickly, the young men from the mast. They can't, they can't shorten them. They can't shorten the sheets. And the sails tear and the booms come down, and the men do everything possible to throw things over that, including the water. That was the situation for a day and a half on these five ships. And at the end of it, around the uh, 21st, the records reached that the Admiral looked out to sea, and there were no other ships. They were all missing. Now, at that point, that same storm hits Menendez and his escort ship, and the same thing happens to him, but they stay afloat. So the Admiral, uh, and this is all recorded not only by, by three people on this trip, all this is recorded, and I found those records. That's why I'm telling you the story. This is not guessing. So the Admiral, um, Diego Valdez, takes his one ship and heads for the destination that little island, Dominico, off of Puerto Rico. And that's what usually happens when you go due west. On the way, he does find one of the ships. So now there's two ships. And on August 4th, he leaves Dominico to try to go into San Juan in Puerto Rico, San Juan Harbor. And sure enough, he spots Menendez and his peasant. 
And you can imagine the emotions at that time. They lost four ships. Three went down, one they had to turn back, and they lost 232 men. And his mission, just think of it, those of you who have been in the service, your mission and your mission for your life was to be there before the French. So he's in a situation where he goes to the governor, a very friendly and helpful governor, and he says, I know the trouble you were in, and, and before we talk, let me tell you some more bad news, just so you know, he says. We know what happened to two of those ships that were missing. Uh, one went to a nearby island, and the Creek Indians captured them and ate them. Another ship went down to Jamaica, and a, a French privateer caught them, and he pushed all your crew overboard. Now, that's not enough, he said. The king sent an escort ship here, a, a dispatch ship, a couple weeks ago to let all of us know in the hierarchy in the Indies that you were coming and to help you. And he showed us your path of what, what you intended to do. The French caught that ship. They know you're coming. They know you're headed toward Havana, and they know you're going to go up the eastern side of the peninsula. So if you continue on that course, uh, expect an ambush. Um, one other piece of bad news, he said, the king earlier, we were, we were aware that he sent an order to the governor of Hispanola and the governor of Cuba to provide three ships and 550 men. They have decided that the risk is too high to give them to you. It's either far enough away from Spain, they think they have that independence. Can you imagine how he feels? Um, he believed in God, he believed in his king, he had a mission, the most important in his life, and now he's got four ships when he was planning to have 16 and 2,000 men. All this is true, by the way. Um, so what he does, he only confides in, the, in, the, in his men of Sherwood Forest, uh, five or six of the situation. He doesn't tell his crew a damn thing. He, he can't because there are French spies in San Juan. He knows them. They all know that. If he was to tell his crew, they'd get it, and they'd know that they're aware that they're going to be ambushed. He doesn't want them to know. He wants the French to know that he's going to stay on the course. He leaves harbor around August 15th. Four ships, they're all still wrapped, you know, with, with wire. It's, it's, it's an, they, but they can limp out. And he says, we're going to try to do this. We, you know, revolt could be held up in a, in a, in, in a, you know, without any sales. We don't know that. We're going to go with four, five, four ships. The governor gives him another one. It's in equally bad shape. So he has five ships. He takes on August 15th. And as he gets right, um, let's see, as he gets right in the northern coast here, he sends out an order to me to drop anchor, meet me in my, in my stateroom. So what happens is the five ships captains meet him there and the 10 uh, military infantry captains meet him there. He, the levels of them, he says, here's what's happening. We're headed for an ambush. And there's only five of us. We've lost 232 men. He said, but there's no reason we can't make it through the, the Bahama Islands and go straight. And of course, they interrupt him and says, what do you mean? It's cursed. We all know it's cursed. Your son died trying to get through there. Um, and we have no charts. It's dangerous. He says, it may be dangerous. It will be dangerous. We can get through there. I know we can. And from a point of leadership, when you study all these documents, you find out one thing. Menendez didn't make a decision on risk analysis. He made it on, based on his knowledge of what he and his top men could do. And he knew they'd been trained so well in really tough situations that if there was a chance to get through, he believed, truly believed he could do it. So to settle his sergeant, he says, look, I'm gonna go on the main deck and pray for two hours. I'm gonna come back in two hours, and I either want a yes or no. You're either with this game or we're, we'll, we'll turn back. And of course, with the discussion, they had to remind themselves of what he's done in the past and what his team had. And when he came back, they said, we're with you, let's go. 
and how dangerous it was. And the first two nights of that trip that they went through, the first two days, they dropped anchor at night because they didn't know where they were at night. The captains of the, uh, uh, three of the ships came to the Menendez and said, we've got to turn back. It's more dangerous than I thought. We're bouncing off islands. We hit the bottom three times. He said, now we're going to keep on going. And I think it took them two weeks, but it was actually shorter than going through and they landed in tears, crying, and they spotted Florida. And then they headed north to see if they were the first. And they think they, they approached the harbor off the St. John's River on September 4th. And when he looked out, he saw the French fleet. He lost the race and he had told the entire Spanish government that the only way we can kick them out is to be there first. If we are second, we will lose North America. And he was dead serious. But here's the leader's leader. Here's Robin Hood. Takes his men aside and say, look, they're here first. But I think the game's just begun. I said, there's, there's going to be a way we can get that fort and we can get that fleet. And I don't know what it is, but stay with me. We're going to drop down to St. Augustine, 30 miles south. They got a shallow harbor here. Um, Spain never intended, by the way, to make St. Augustine any settlement. It was an accident, pure accident. So they settled down there. He dropped anchor. He had his two large ship anchor uh, a mile or so off the, the coast. And then he sent his three smallest ships in that shallow harbor and tie up against uh, the land. And he knew one thing, he told his men this, he says, you know, typically we take 30 days to unload. He says, he's gonna come in after us knowing we're unloading. I want us unloaded in 10 days. But while he was sleeping on the ninth day, all this is documented, he woke up in the middle of the night. He had a dream. He had a, a premonition that Rebo was going to attack him in a few hours. He woke up, he awakened all his key officers, and he says, get out to those ships, take their anchors away, and sail them away, and I'll be with you. He took a smallest ship with a towing boat. He ran out to those two ships. They took a few emergency things off. He put uh, about 20 men on them and said, go. In the, at, this was early in the morning and no longer did he did they take off and go over the horizon then sure enough those four revolt ships appeared and he had to take this small ship and race to the entrance and they almost caught him but the, uh, at the last minute a breeze pushed them through this shallow harbor the four deep water uh, French ships could not enter but they had to wait for him they couldn't wait too long because once he got on shore there was evidence that a nor'easter storm was brewing. So the four ships, instead of waiting, had to kind of crawl, try to get out to sea, but the winds were coming heavily from the north. And when he got on shore, he met with a couple of Indians who did not like the French. And they said, look, we know, we know you're trying to get in to that fort through the front door, through the St. John's River. But guess what? There's a back door. And he says, there's nothing but marshes and trees and rivers to go inland. But we have actually done it over a two-day period, we Indians, and we can find that fort for them. Mendez thought about it, and he knew he also had a French prisoner that once they got to the St. John's River could tell them which gate to go through, and that's kind of detail. So he immediately ordered 500 of his men, almost all the entire infantry, He's, uh, and I think this is on the 16th of September, he says, we're gonna march. And basically what he was saying, we're gonna march without weapons because the, their main weapon was an arquebus, a compression, you pull the, uh, you light a fuse and then the, the hammer hits the powder. But with the rain, you have no weapon. So they had no weapons and they complained about, we don't have any weapons. He says, we have pikes and we have swords and we're gonna surprise them. And on the 500 that marched, 100 decided to turn around, you know, for whatever reason, but he, on the third day, they came up to the river in the back door and they attacked, they attacked the, um, the French. And he, he left and he yelled, save the women and the children. 
He was a compassionate person when he could be. And after they, they basically, I think they killed a hundred Frenchmen, uh, about a hundred escaped in the river with the three small ships. He sunk one of them, two cut their cables and went back in safety down the river. And almost the next day, he returned with 50 men to St. Augustine, which was difficult because that storm was coming and they didn't know what direction was south or north. So they'd, they'd tell a soldier, climb that tree and see if you can see any, any sunlight. And that's the only way they got back. But about a day after they got back, they got some terrible news. Terrible and positive. The, apparently two of Revolt's ships had crashed ashore. And there were, you know, several hundred men there, the Indians reported. Um, good for Re Menendez, I guess, because that means he's won the war. Um, bad because there's 200 Frenchmen on the shore. So he takes a party to go down there. Now he only has 200 men at St. Augustine. He left 300 up the river at St. John's. So he has no way to, to either feed or to protect and imprison 200 Frenchmen. And so he made a decision that you and I would be cruel. But in that period of time, it was common sense. This was a period, the 16th century, where you didn't negotiate peace, you didn't, you didn't get together, you basically went at it. And he made a decision, the only way we can deal with this is to execute those men. And he executed about 200 men. Um, he said, they, they came over and they said, we'll do whatever you want. He fed them and then he killed them. Now, that's terrible. But if you and I were at that time, you and I would do, I would say the same thing. He had no way to protect him. He had no way to feed him. The following day, he got another report that Rebel and his ship in a companion ship were ashore with about 450 men. Now he has the same issue. And uh, Rebel pleads for, uh, you know, a peace, send me back and so forth. And he basically says, I can't do it. And he, uh, I think he executes a hundred. One Frenchman comes up to him and says, you don't want to kill me. He says, why, what's the story? He says, I have information that you need and it's worth saving my life. And he said, well, tell me what you got. He said, I'm the chief navigator on the flagship for France. And I know their plans. Their plans are these. This spring, they're gonna come with another armada and we're gonna put a second fort down at the Martyrs, which is their name for Key West, at the point of the peninsula. And for, with that, we'll have two forts to ambush the returning treasure. The next year, we are gonna put another um, invasion basically into the uh, Caribbean and we're gonna land somewhere. I don't know where it is, it may be Havana. And we're gonna exercise slave revolts. Think about this. Past February 15th, he was with the king. The king says, what do you think is going to happen? He says, they're going to go down the peninsula and then they're going to enter the, the Caribbean and have slave revolts. And that was exactly their plan. And then this hit it right on the head. Now, and the second group of revolts troops where he had to execute another hundred people, another hundred just refused to come and they escaped. And when he met them later, because he wanted to wipe out any French resistance, he allowed them to go free. So this was a man, not a man of cruelty, and this was not a time when uh, the people were, this was normal operating procedure at that time. So what he did as soon as he, the war was over, here he, here he, here he lost the race and he basically won the war through his ingenuity and his comrades and through some good little weather, luck with the weather. But they were without food. So he immediately, basically in October, November, heads for Havana to get some of these ships that were missing from Northern Spain. And he finds three of them and he finds the Admiral. And he gets no help from the governor who doesn't want to help him for some reason on anything. And he heads back to St. Augustine with the food. And when he heads back, it's high of rest, the 
troops want to leave, they want to get in the gold fields, but he settles them down. He goes up to Fort Caroline, settles them down, and then he does something that I discovered only a few months ago through some documents that are from the, from the uh, archives of the Indies. And this is something I'm telling you that no one else has ever heard. Um, he has three small ships, brigantines, and he says, now we're gonna go and we're gonna settle. We're gonna land and find the Punta and Santa Elena. So he goes up, first of all, to check on the troops north in Fort Caroline, and he meets some of the Indians. And the Indians tell him that what happened when <coughs> Revolt's ship was sinking is before it sunk and went against the rocks, it dispatched a, sh a big boat with 15 Frenchmen to go and find Fort Caroline and get help. That boat, the Indians said, went to the mouth of the river and we're told that it's under Spanish control. So the 15 Frenchmen went on to an Indian village in the middle of today's Georgia, a Gwali village, and they should be there now. Well, when Menendez heard that, he says, I've got to eliminate that French threat. I mean, they can grow into something important in that area. So on his way to Santa Elena, he stopped off at this village. He took one of his ships in, left two of his small ships out in the water, and he soon found the village. And he was met by a French soldier. And the French soldier said, uh, yes, a couple weeks ago, uh, 14 others took the boat and left here. They've been here for some while, several months. And they went up to Newfoundland because they know we have a fishing fleet there. So that was their ticket to go north, find the fishing fleet, and get back to France. But he says, meanwhile, he said, I will tell you, the, the uh, chief here is very much pro-French. And then this meets the chief. He says, I understand that you have uh, fostered a friendship with the French. But he says, in my opinion, you're, you're talking to people with a, a, the wrong religion. The real religion is Catholicism. <laughs> and uh, we've heard that before. Um, and the chief says, well, tell me your story. And then Menendez noticed that he's got two Indian prisoners from the Arista tribe, which he knows is around Santa Elena. And he says, what are you doing with these Indians? He said, we are at war with the Aristas, and we've captured two of them, we're gonna kill them. He said, well, rather than kill them, why don't we take them off your hands and we'll deliver them and get a peace treaty between the two of you. And the king says, I don't know. And Menendez says, look, if you want to be a real Christian, you've got to be a real Christian. You've got to let these people go, and I'll give you a couple of my men until I return. And then the chief says, we will do anything because we have not had rain for nine months. And it was that promise, I think, of the chief. He says, our people are dying. Nine months we haven't had rain. So he agreed to take two of Menendez's Spanish soldiers, and he took Menendez left with the two prisoners. He found Santa Elena, and of course he was greeted with open arms by the Arista chiefs because he had captured two of the prisoners that would have been killed. And the Arista Indians did everything possible in April of 1566 to show him where he should build his first settlement. Now here's the end of the story. Now he had to go back to the chief and tell him what happened, the good news. He has a peace treaty. He goes back, finds the Wally chief in what is now Georgia. And the first thing the chief says is, I am a Christian. Immediately, there's a downpour of water. <laughs> this was a true story. And I thank you. Now you must, I hope you have some questions. How about some tough questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. What do you think when uh, went over to actually form a settlement in San 
the biggest, uh, it was roughly, uh, the biggest was 15, 68, 15, 69. They had maybe 125 uh, of them. Um, they were as large in 1569 as the city of Havana, by the way. <laughs> yes, sir. So, you know, Spain, France. <laughs> It was a real competition, but their motivation was just <coughs> to settle a new land. Um, you're saying what was Spain's motivation? Well, between the two of them, it was a competition, but the main motivation was to settle a new land, right? To I think the main motivation was to be the first to settle and to control. Remember the Pope yeah. in, um, 14, 1513 gave all of the Americas through the Treaty of Tordesillas to Spain, except for Brazil. So they wanted to control what they had and they were encouraged by gold and silver. Columbus really wanted to get to China and Indies, but they got stopped when they found gold and silver, right? So what they did through De Soto and the following conquistadors is say, if we did so well down there, Maybe in North America is the same situation. So the whole thought was you got to get North America because you might have the same situation. And they went by the argument that the Pope had given the whole land. France, meanwhile, which agreed with that initially, when they saw they had gold, said, no, nah, the Pope doesn't have the authority. We want part of the action. And, it, and Spain was their enemy. And a, and a secondary goal was their religion. France, mm -hmm. France wanted to make sure that um, they had a chance to put, because, it, because the privateering was under the control of a Protestant, the Protestant, meaning Caligny, wanted to make sure that they had a chance to, to get there and push Spain out. There was this hatred and envy issue. Yes, sir. I've always been fascinated that, um, I hazard a guess, and most of us here never heard about this aspect of American history. That's right. Growing up and so forth. What is it simply a matter that the eventual victors, which end up being the British, um, they control the narrative and yeah. suppress this, yeah. or did this yeah. get lost to history, or it got, it, it, it got lost because, and they created the English myth. I have a video on that to answer that. It's dynamic. Basically, the ones who wrote the first history books. That's what stuck. And Spain was in a position of fighting for its life and didn't have the resources to control the invasions of England. England got stronger. And what really happened, when you think about it, is initially Spain, a population at the time of 8, 9 million, was against France, a population of 18 million. So they had much deeper resources and pockets. And the, and the failure was really many of the same things today. They, they stretched themselves out too thin, so they were in debt four times during this period while they were the most powerful. Um, and, and they couldn't put in the resources to protect what they, they had. So England basically said, you're not protecting anything north of uh, Charleston, we're gonna move in, and that's what happened. And, and Spain eventually had to basically trade properties they had in North America to prevent England and, and France and Netherlands from grabbing the Caribbean. They wanted to at least hold on to the Caribbean. Lacquer, almost everything we hear about today was the problem that caused Spain's drop 200 years later. They would only allow, here was a small country that needed millions of people to help settle, and they would only allow pure Catholic to go on the ship. Even if you're a mixed Catholic, you couldn't do it. <laughs> they, they wouldn't allow the peasants to rise up in a leadership position. They had all kinds of needs for managers, they could never go about being a peasant. So they relied on nobles, which often did not have the skills. Um, and at the same time, right before this happened, they put a tax called a akabala on their heavy industries. At any time they were inland and moved to a different city to, to export, that city could give them a 10% increase in taxes. 
and they basically ruined all their heavy industries. So at the time when they opened up the Americas, they had very little to sell. They had to go to their enemies to get wood for their beams. It was a crazy situation. It's almost like a repeat now. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's like, if you want to know what's, what's going on now, it's going to happen, read this story. Because Spain reigned to the top, actually was the first to control North America, and in 200 years went downhill because they didn't have, they didn't allow the people in, they didn't allow women to do uh, leadership skills, they overreached, and they taxed their business out of business. Any questions? Yes, sir. How well developed were the uh, nautical instruments in the 16th century specifically? Could they determine longitude at that point? No. So they knew where they were across, but they could determine latitude? Uh, very good question, by the way. Um, they, could, they had latitude only. So when they would come up in that direct run north through the Bahama Islands, the navigator would say, I think we're 30 miles from the shore. And someone else said, no, I think we're 300. They didn't have longitude. They, had, uh, they didn't have a round wheel. They had a, a, a staff, and they'd have four or five men down below doing that. Um, they had a stick that used sun size, usually at noon. So they, they want to know where they are, it's almost at noon. Of course, they used dead reckoning. Um, very limited, very limited equipment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how long did Santa Elena exist, and what happened to it? Existed 21 years. In 1574, Menendez was called uh, by the king to go back to uh, to Spain, and we think he was getting ready. Remember the big attack Spain had against the British fleet in 1588? We think he was basically priming him to uh, to do that. They were losing control in in, uh, in the English Channel, and while he's doing that, he died. He, I forget what it was, influenza or something. And now he had to turn over uh, the reins of the governorship to a nephew. And no one was as strong, necessary, I mean, to get money, you know, for an impoverished colony. Um, and finally, Drake came through, uh, went into the Caribbean in 1587 and bombarded Spain's major ports at Cartagena and Havana, and then came up and attacked St. Augustine and obliterated St. Augustine. And they sent a messenger up to Santa Elena and said, um, he's coming. Uh, he actually missed the port, but they basically decided at that point to regroup and move everything in Santa Elena down to St. Augustine. Basically, they didn't have the people, the resources to stay here, but they, they maintained a Coast Guard all the way up to Charleston. So they, they claimed control, but they left the area. Yes, ma'am. So how well developed was that first settlement? Were they um, self-sustaining at all? Yes, they were, but they got to be. Their first problem was they, they tried to, uh, was really a self-inflicted wound. They had um, 324 people. They had a, at least two forts, grew to five forts. They had a plaza and they had houses for the peasants and houses for the government officials. Uh, and they had farms. And some of the farms were actually extended over to today's Port Royal. Um, but they had a, a, a convention that they called a tribute. When they saw the Indians, the order was be friendly with them, but offer them to protection. But for that protection, the Indians will give you a tribute in either food or services. Well, when things got tough, the Spanish basically go out and took the food. And now you know what happens. Arrows are flying. And in 1576, the town was actually burned. Uh, they rebuilt it. And at that time, when Mendez died, they took a strong arm approach and just obliterated the Indians around so they had safe harbor. So they were very close to selling uh, timber for the ships, you know, um, the uh, fish, things like that, melons. Uh, it had promises, but it lacked, it lacked resources. It lacked the food you need to start anything. But it had all the components, men, women, um, priests, 
and there's all kinds of interesting stories. I wish we had more time I could tell you. There's no remnants of that early, like, archaeological Oh, things. yes, there is. Well, that's yeah. the problem. I mean, I, I haven't gone through it, but the state needs to, and the country needs to take action. And it's going to require the Marine Corps to get off its butt. <laughs> and I'm a Marine Corps fan. But um, what needs to be done is a study to, to say how can we develop that area and put archaeologists there. Yeah. State archaeology is very weak here, but they've done diggings on 3% of the property and they've found two forts, uh, Menendez's house, the plaza, and other things. But they need money, just like, if you've ever been to Jamestown? Archaeologists on site, they're uncovering all the time, interest is in there, they, they have a historical museum. We need the same thing. And if we do it, if we do just one step, which is have plays either at Hilton Head here or on Santa Elena. The Lost County gets 40,000 visitors a year and they've grown a whole industry up. I estimate that with simple steps um, provided by the state and the county, we can probably uh, generate one to three billion dollars within 20 years. And that's just, that's using data that from the state's tourism department and, and what others have done. But we're going to have to take a series of steps, and one is to get the Marine Corps Commandant off his butt. I've tried to reach him. I've suggested we have a conference call. We've, we've outlined how we can show alternatives behind the scenes with him, uh, and he won't answer our call. So, you know, the answer is we'll get Lindsey Graham, who's on the Armed Forces Committee, to visit him. But we got to do things in order. Um, this is a major source of revenue and the right kind of revenue for us because these people largely come in, leave their money, and go back home. And that's the kind we want. Uh, <laughs> some of them stay, but you know, we get rid of them. Uh, I don't think so. Well, they may have. They may have done a little bit. I mean, but without any funding and direction from the Commandant's office, what you have is basically local war warfare with their legal department, who's, who basically says you have a heck of site design, the reason it's got to do this and that, and we only use the South Carolina Archaeological Department, which has no funds. I mean, they got to raise money to come here. Um, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's not reasonable. It's yeah, not right. It's, it's in the paper the last they may have done some little thing, but they have had no money to do a serious development. What do we need the Marine Corps to do? What? What do we need the Marine Corps to do? Well, they have control of, of Paris Island. So what we need them to do is work with a committee that, of like Smithsonian and Jamestown and others and say, how do we develop this so the people can see it? So you don't go on a dirt path. During the last hurricane, what was it, three years ago, they cleaned up the, the golf course next to it in two weeks. It took them one year to clean the path of the Santa Elena site. That gives you an idea of their interest. Yeah, I mean, it's a serious problem. It's, and I can understand their mission and all that stuff. I, I love the Marines. But it's not being managed. It's not seen by the Marines as important. And it's the most important archaeological site in this country. It's a new comment. Yep. David Burke. And if excitement was raised about this, you would have tourists coming. Yeah, yeah, and that's what happens with excavation. You learn more and more. There's really not history unless you take documents and match them with what you find in the earth. Because, you know, some historians will exaggerate all over the place. I don't exaggerate. Uh, but that's what you really need. And, and if you, anyone's been to Jamestown, you get a feel of what we can do. And it comes to life. And we need to, we need to change and modify this history for our grandchildren. I mean, uh, we really do. Yes, ma'am. Question. If you had a magic wand, and you have all the 60-some folks here, what would you suggest we do as a citizen? Can you think about the citizen you were for the peace talks table? What would you suggest we do to help change that story? Well, the biggest thing, and um, this is going to sound like self-serving, but I, I make no money, by the way, on selling these books. With eight years of cost, there's no way I could possibly make, even possibly make a dollar. So, my mission is to get our history changed correctly. Um, you, you need to know this story. The 
it's deeper than what I've told you. And then you need to start talking to people. My strategy is simply this. Um, the best way to get real progress going is for a group of us to, to define three likely options on how this thing can grow. Option one, you do, for example, the lost colony thing. You do it on, the, on Paris Island, maybe you do it in, in um, as well as Hilton Head. Well, the biggest thing is to read this and talk to people in Hilton Head, because that's the big draw for, per, for tourism. I mean, they get like several million a year, you know, we get a few, maybe 20,000. Uh, once we get them going, the push we will have is through the county. Now, quite frankly, if we had three options with support from Hilton Head, I know we could ask probably today for a couple hundred thousand dollars in the county and they would approve it because they're tuned in enough of them. They're in Buford. And then we would go outside because the government listens to outside advisors um, and say, just as you've done in Jamestown, tell us the economic impact of these three options. Option one, a play. Option two, reconstructed buildings in a spot in Hilton Head and boat traffic between Hilton Head and there. And with that, the Marine Corps does certain things to make it presentable, and we put another something there. Option four should be a complete Smithsonian kind of building holding all the history of this, this stuff, and there's a lot of history out there that we collect so students can do it. Um, that's what's gonna create this one to two billion dollars, one to three billion dollars. And then, with the approval of let's say two, three hundred thousand by the county, which I think we could get today, uh, we will get, uh, we will use uh, basically help from Lindsey Graham, who's on the Armed Forces Committee, to get some action going by the Marine Corps, and together with a committee, a very objective committee, have a plan going forward. Um, so I would say the most effective way right now is to read this book. You want to read it anyway. It's a, it's a. If you like Robin Hood, you're going to love this. <laughs> but I had to put in enough detail to, to know to tell them I know what the hell I'm talking about. And if you're working anything for eight years, you know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm anxious to get the, back and do some shrimping and crabbing. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, at one time, I'm going back a, a few years now, there used to be a display in the second floor of the visitor center over in the, the old arsenal in Buford that covered the St. Atlanta because one of the descendants from Menendez came from Spain yeah. and actually did a talk there. Then, oh, they're all modern, yes. Yeah, and then they moved to the old federal courthouse and yeah. they used to have, That's I right. remember going, to, but then that closed. They're still they ran out of their lease? And it was moved basically in a deep freeze down at the Coastal Discovery Mag Museum, which is not likely to be a good place for it. It's, the Coastal Discovery is sort of like natural history. You study butterflies and, and crustaceans and things like that. Uh, we need the real thing. If you've been to Jamestown, it's got to go in that direction. Uh, with it, uh, quite frankly, I think I put it in. This is something. Uh, just to go over it. In short, we're the first settlement in the United States now. This is where America began. South Carolina was where it began. Punta Santa Elena was your first strategic target. First Europeans in North America were here. And our school books need to be changed. I think also the Hispanics, which, you know, I think many of our people think that they're the last come through our gates because of all this recent turmoil. They were the first. And almost everything we've been taught about how America was first settled is dead wrong. Uh, and what I get out of this, the number one thing I get out of this, and I'm thinking about my grandchildren, is our kids are faced with all kinds of barriers, increased socialism, things that why you can't do something. And this tells the story of Caligny and Menendez. And they had the most incredible barriers in front of them. Yet, because they had character first, and then they had stamina, and they had a group of close friends that were willing to stay with them, they accomplished the impossible. My God, Clinton, a lone Presbyterian, 
He might have been rich, but he had a whole country against him. And he led France into a race to see who would be the first to control this country. Menendez, a peasant, broke the barrier, became a noble. Everybody hated him, the bureaucracy. And so I think it's a message to the children of you can do almost anything. And yeah, we, we agree you don't like your principal. You don't like this. But hang in there. Character, stamina, and friends will take you. That's the key message that I get out of this whole story. And the story is quite more exciting than the movie. And you ask me what my strategy is. Um, by mid-January, we will attempt to contact three of the major um, streaming services like Disney. And we put together five years of episodes just in the details of the story. And you know, your odds are one to a thousand. But I think it's a hell of a story. And the Robin Hood story was made into a movie 24 times. And I haven't seen a story that's more exciting when you read this book, and I would encourage you to do it. And I'd encourage you to, as soon as you read it, send it to your, your children. Um, and, uh, and then I want to go share. <laughs> I actually think the story of just the race itself has all the elements of a great Hollywood screenplay. It does. <laughs> it does. And, and I haven't told you some details. I mean, there's, like when Menendez lands down at um, the Canary Islands, all of a sudden he sees his future son-in-law, who, who previously asked to be on the, the mine, he says, no, it's too dangerous, you're going to get married. He shows up, he says, the hell with it, I want to be in this thing. <laughs> he becomes a real star. He also meets two men that supposedly have a, a reference from an other friend in Spain, and they become traitors. And all this surfaces. It's a hell of a story. And um, so anyway, I'm gonna do my best just to get the spotlight on it so we can change our history. Okay? Thanks.